Hey, on behalf of uh, uh, myself and my family, congratulations to all the moms. We love you. We're grateful for uh, your uh, investment in our lives. And uh, I'm grateful to my mom. And Rachel, if you're watching this sometime in the future, just want you to know I love you and I'm grateful for everything you've done for me. Now, I want you to know the summer schedule because I think it's really important that before things get out of control, you know what's coming up. So hopefully you'll, uh, you'll mark some of those important dates down. But Mother's Day is important, and I, I talk just for a moment here about it. And the reason we know it's important is the researchers tell us, all the experts that analyze this stuff, say that we will spend almost $163 on average on mom in this country this year. That's what they're estimating. The total, the total is $19.9 billion will be spent on mom. Now, some of you are going, hey, I hope I see some of that love today, right? There's still time if you've forgotten, okay? But I was prepping for this message, and I came across this headline from Psychology Today. And this was the headline, Top 10 Reasons Why Moms Are Important. And I thought, you know, that's a fair read. So I started reading it, and it's really a clinical read. There's no feeling, no emotion in there. They drained all that out, and they had this article just on pragmatic reasons, just factual reasons why moms are so important to us. And this was their number one reason. Number one, if, you, if it weren't for your mom, you wouldn't be breathing right now. If nothing else, you should thank her for that. No emotion, just let's get right to the facts, right? And that's pretty much settles it. How valuable is your life to you? Pretty valuable, I would guess. Your mom is the key person who made that happen. Now, dad plays a part, but let's face it, from the beginning, mom puts her, her own life on the line for each one of her children. And that's why we will spend $19.9 billion today, or leading up to today, on mom. Have you ever noticed how we measure nearly everything and the value of everything in life based upon how much it costs? Have you noticed that? Money is such a big part of our lives. A lot of our regrets, our hopes for the future, our arguments, things we get to do, things we don't get to do, all have to do with money. And sometimes when it comes to finding health in this area of money. We think the answer is out there somewhere. We're waiting for the windfall to come. We're just waiting for things to get better for us financially. We want our home prices that we own to go up. We want our investments to go up, our income to go up. But we also want certain things to go down. We want gas prices to go down. We want expenses like groceries and electricity and gas, you know, in our home to go down. We want the taxes to go down. And if we're not careful, we could find ourselves feeling kind of helpless waiting for the economy to get better. Waiting for this thing that is so beyond our control to actually get better. And all the while, we're not maximizing our own personal economy. So while everybody else is fretting about where things stand in the the world economy, something you can't control, I want to talk this morning with you about your personal economy, something that you can control. Now this is your own personal economy. It's, It's defined rather easily. It's how you spend, how you save, and how you give. Those, that's the basic essence of your personal economy. And these three areas, saving, uh, spending, saving, and giving, will have a much greater effect on your financial well-being than anything else that does or does not happen in the economy. Now, this series we're doing called Overflow, it's only two weeks. So I, I hope you'll make a point to be here next week, and if you can't, at least check it out online. I'm convinced that this series has some profound things for every one of our lives. I think it can move the dial significantly in this area of our personal economy. In fact, my wish for everyone is that money could be fun again. I mean, what if for the rest of 2018 and as a precedent for the rest of our lives, we took the principles that we're gonna look at in this series with the idea that they will make money fun again. Wouldn't that be great? 
When we talk about the Bible and money, though, especially from a platform like this, there's always people that start to grumble. Don't you dare mix God into my money. That's my money. I earned it. I can do with it what I want. Don't mix God and money. But the reality is, is we mix God and money all the time. I mean, think about it. When we run out of money, and there's a few checks out there that haven't cleared, and there's no money in the account to cover it, and the, you know that if it goes any longer, there's a couple auto drafts that are going to pop up, and they're not, there's no money for them. And so what we do is we start to pray. We bring God into money. We bring him into our own economy, don't we? We're like, God, please slow those checks down. Don't let them hit before I get paid on Friday. Please, please, God, don't, don't let that go through. And the irony is that we want God involved in those moments because we know he can move mountains. We're in a jam, we need him, but we don't always want God involved. And that's reality. But what if he was involved? What if we took his advice, we took his input in how we should manage our personal economy? What I hope to share with you this morning from the Bible are principles that can put money back in its proper place, hopefully make it fun again. To the degree that Ann and I have lived out these principles over our married life, we've had less stress about money, we've lowered our debt, we've increased our savings, and we've had money to give to God and to others in need. Early in our marriage though, Ann and I struggled with the principle of saving. We just couldn't save. Our incomes were so small, and I'm not, I'm not asking for any sympathy. The reality was we just didn't make a lot of money when we first got married. So after giving our tithes and then paying our bills, there was almost nothing left. I mean, how sad. I mean, when you think about the stress that we lived with when we had one of those unexpected financial hits, you know, typically it had to do with one of our cars, a dead battery or a flat tire or something simple like that. And we just weren't prepared for it. Eventually, we saved enough for an emergency fund, which took the pressure off. But money stress is brutal. Anybody agree with that? Once upon a time, though, money was probably fun for you. Maybe you have to go all the way back to when you were a kid, but it was fun. You remember? When I was a kid, I was in elementary school, I remember going to the school, and our school would put up these snow fences. You know what a snow fence is? It's this wooden fence they unroll every, every fall so that the snow will drift against that so they don't have to plow the parking lots as much. And the, this was in the spring, early spring, snow was all gone, and there was all this trash against the snow fence. And I, was happened to be, I just happened to be at the school playing, and I walked by and I looked down and I saw a $10 bill just plastered against the snow fence. The wind had blown it there and it just stuck. And I picked it up and looked at it and I thought, that's a $10 bill. And I could not believe it. I mean, this was more money I had held in my own hands ever. And so I ran home and I announced to my whole family, I got a $10 bill. I found it. And my dad said, where'd you find it? I said, against the snow fence. And he said, you know what? If there's a $10 bill there, there might be more. And I, oh, I started thinking about thousands of dollars. So I ran back as fast as I had run home. This time, though, my sister is trailing behind me because she's like, I want to get in on this action. And so I went and looked, and you know what? I found another dollar bill, a single. I had $11 as, as an elementary kid. I, I had hit the jackpot. Luckiest guy on the planet. Think about it. Some of you may have to think back a ways to find out that time when money was fun, that first time you ever held a bill like this in your hand. You remember these? That's a Benjamin right there. 100 simoles. That's what I called it when I was a kid. 100 simoles right there. I don't even know what a simole is, but that's what we called it. Do you remember the first time you got one of these? Maybe you earned it. I don't know. Maybe you stole it. I don't know. Do you remember? <laughs> remember how exciting it was to hold it in your own hand? Some of you were like, oh, man, it's been a long time. Can I hold yours? No, you cannot, okay? You cannot. You think about it, it's been a long time. Maybe for some of you it never has happened. You've never held 100 simoles in your hand before. Just remember back to that first big moment, that big paycheck moment. Your first job, your first real pay, uh, your first real paycheck, and you cashed it, and you held the money in your hands. Or you had that check and you were looking at 
the numbers on it. And it was so exciting of a moment. And that moment promised to provide all this satisfaction that that money was going to bring. I mean, you can put this money in the bank and you can feel some satisfaction from security or you can spend it on something or an experience, the, the satisfaction of enjoyment. Or maybe, maybe you just want to show it off to your friends and get the satisfaction of their jealousy. Yeah, that's a monster within. You should watch that video. But <clears throat> we spend most of our adult lives trying to maximize the satisfaction that money can give us. And th- but there's one problem with that. We're never fully satisfied by the things that money gives us, are we? I mean, if we're really honest about it, I mean, there is some satisfaction, but we're not fully satisfied. For instance, I don't know if you remember that first big money payday, what you spent your money on. I had $11. I don't remember. I'm probably sure I spent it on candy. But I don't ever remember. I don't remember. Why? Because the satisfaction didn't last a lifetime, that's for sure. I'm sure it's amazing uh, the thing that you bought on that first payday or that first, first time you had a Benjamin. Or maybe, maybe you saved the money and there was that sense of satisfaction. You stuck it in the bank and there's some security that comes with that. Or That doesn't last for very long. Or maybe flash the money around with your friends and trying to make them envious of you, and then eventually they convinced you to break that $100 and, and spend it on video games or buying burgers and fries or whatever. You were big shot for a moment, and then the money was gone. This cycle repeats itself over and over again throughout our adulthood, doesn't it? You get money, and you spend your more money over and over and over, but it, It's just like those famous theologians, the Rolling Stones once said, I can't get no satisfaction. Thank you, rockers, thank you. And some of you are bobbing your head as you do it, right? There's never enough security, there's never enough freedom, there's never enough pleasure, and we end up dissatisfied, wanting more money to get more things that still won't solve our problem of satisfaction. Does that register with anybody here? Here's the good news. The good news is that God cares about your money. God cares about your money because he cares about you, and he cares about every facet of your life. He knows you need money to take care of your needs. He even cares about your satisfaction, all those things your heart wants. But here's the secret that can take a lifetime to learn. Money can get you a lot of things, but only God can give you the gift of satisfaction. Money will fill your wallet. It can fill your bank account. It can fill your life with all kinds of things, all kinds of experiences. But only God can fill your heart with the love and joy and peace that really brings true satisfaction. The big idea today is this. Money fills your life with stuff, but God fills your heart with satisfaction. So if you want to maximize your satisfaction in life, you don't need more money in your heart, in your, li- in your bank account. You need more God in your heart. So how do you maximize this satisfaction? How do you make money fun again? Well, that's the question we're going to try to answer this morning. And we're going to do it by taking a look at a guy who was considered the smartest, wisest, richest man ever lived. His name was King Solomon. You're probably familiar with him. If you read Proverbs, much of what you read in there are life lessons that he recorded. Somebody said it's kind of like reading his diary. These are, the, these are the things that he learned through the course of his life. Proverbs is a book of time-tested wisdom that people have been reading and looking to for centuries to learn how to get better with money and happiness, that satisfaction that comes. So if you want to follow along with your Bibles or your mobile devices, we're going to start off with Proverbs 3, 13, and 14. Listen to what what Solomon writes. Joyful is the person who finds wisdom, the one who gains understanding. For wisdom is more profitable than silver, and her wages are better than gold. So the first thing, if we're, if we're going to track with Solomon, the first thing that he's going to advise us is invest in wisdom. Invest in wisdom. Wisdom is the key to living well in all areas of life because wisdom is the power to make good decisions and learn things the easy way rather than the hard way. Now, if you want to correct mistakes that you've made in the past or you want to avoid making mistakes in the future, you really need to open your eyes, your ears, and your heart and listen 
to the wisdom of Solomon. A lot of times, this is stuff that seems almost too obvious to be real, right? It's like so simple. How did I miss it? Let me give me an example. It's kind of like these overly obvious answers that kids gave on tests. The question is, name the quadrilaterals, okay? So Hope actually named this one Bob, this one Sam, this one Tedison, I don't know what that is, and this is Kate, and this is Harry, one R, okay? It's pretty obvious, right? She just named them. This looks like a Harry. Okay, the next one is... Uh, find the difference between eight and two. I think the answer was eight and six. I think the answer was two, but this, this guy, he answers eight is all curly and six is not. Pretty obvious, right? My favorite one was this one, though. <coughs> what ended in 1896? 1895. That cat's got it going, right? He's going places. Probably not to college, but he's going somewhere, Right? Sometimes we overlook the obvious because we're looking for a quick fix. But when it comes to wisdom about money and satisfaction, the answers that wisdom gives you are deceptively obvious. You might be tempted to disregard them and say, well, they're just old school or old fashioned. They're behind the times. But God has placed his stamp of approval on the wisdom available in this book. And we need this wisdom. There was, a, there was a podcast that I listened to uh, recently called Freakonomics Radio. They put a podcast that was actually really, really good. And they replayed in March uh, the 28th of this year one of their best of uh, podcasts from last year. It so, was so popular, they brought it back and replayed it. And the, the name of the podcast, March 28th, you can look it up, was... Everything you always wanted to know about money but were afraid to ask. All right? And in the course of this, this podcast, they make this statement in this episode. They state this, and it's simply this. Roughly 70% of Americans are financially illiterate. I was, they had me. I'm interested now, right? That means they have little or no idea how money actually works. They don't know how to compound interest. They don't know how risk diversification is applied to investments. They just don't know how money works. And the reason for this, they explain on the podcast, is that the millennial generation and the generation that's following them, the Generation Z, never really had to manage money. They never had an after-school job or a weekend job. They were so involved in extracurricular activities, they just didn't have time for that. So their parents just gave them money, and they would spend it. And then one day, they find themselves on their own. No practical experience with money at all. I mean, they've got a debit card, a checking account, and they've got a handful of credit cards, and they've got a bunch of bills. But they have no clue how to manage all this. And the guy leading the podcast said, we need to come back to what is wise to do with our money. That's a good idea. When you seek wisdom as it relates to money, you find things like this in Proverbs. Look at this, Proverbs 13, 11. Wealth from get-rich schemes quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows over time. Now, do you know why I think this is important, why I think it's true? It's because you get rich quick, you get all this money, but you've never learned how to manage it, it's because you didn't get it the normal way, or what some might say the hard way. Now you have all this money, what's gonna happen with it? Well, if you look at statistics, usually it disappears rather rapidly. I mean, how many of us know of someone or have seen the stories of someone who won the lottery only to have their life ruined and eventually the money's gone? Or think about the sports heroes of our, of our history who made millions and millions of dollars. They say more than a normal lifetime salary they make in the NFL in an average of six years. More than what the average person will make in their entire career. They make it in an average of six years. And yet many of them end up bankrupt three to four years after they retire. Why is that? Well, you get it too quick. You don't learn how to manage it. I think that's why the other principle in Proverbs 13, 11 is also true. Wealth from hard work grows over time. 
Why is that? Well, it makes sense because you've learned to manage it. When it was small and then it begins to build over time and therefore it grows and it grows little by little and you've learned to manage it through that process. When we own our own personal economy, we aren't going to wait for a get-rich-quick scheme or wait to win the lottery. If you win the lottery, that's great. I've just learned over time that lots of people lose lots of money trying to win the lottery. Or they try to invest in these get-rich-quick schemes and they end up with nothing. But a wise person will always be that person who prepares. So how do you prepare? Let me give you two real quick, simple things. First, we simply learn to spend less than we make. Sounds obvious, right? This is one of the first rules of financial wisdom. Just spend less than we make. Another thing that we see in Proverbs and really throughout the Bible in general is intentionally avoid debt whenever possible. Now, debt is not sinful. It's not bad. But Proverbs reminds us in Proverbs 22, 7, just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. Dave Ramsey, some of you are familiar with that name from Financial Peace University. He suggests that you pay the minimum on all your debt until you build up $1,000 in an emergency fund. And then you're ready if something goes wrong. Now that may take you a little while, but that's the strategy. And then he says you attack your debt by using what he calls the debt snowball. That approach can build momentum and really take some big chunks out of your debt. Also, he explains there's tremendous power and wisdom in saving in addition to the emergency fund. And finally, he says to consider the power of spending, saving, and giving for maximizing our personal satisfaction. One surefire way to get wisdom like this is to sign up for Financial Peace University. Uh, David mentioned it earlier. It's going to start on June the 3rd, and it's a nine-week course. I hope you'll go to our website if this intrigues you at all and check it out. You can register online. Just go to the website, click on the events tab, and you can sign up right there. When Ann and I were first married, I did not realize it immediately, but over time I became aware that I had married the first female version of Dave Ramsey, okay? And I got to say a much more attractive version as well. But We wanted to have money work for us, so we saved and we attacked our debt. And then seven or eight years ago, we attended a Financial Peace University class here at Northeast and realized that Ann should have written that book a long time ago, back in the 80s. She'd have been been the, the person you know today. She applied all these principles, as many of you have in your own lives, in your own finances. But for for years, Northeast has partnered with Financial Peace University to offer this top-notch program that helps people to get out of the weeds and find financial peace. It'll put you light years ahead of where you are right now, where you can get on your own, because the information that they give is like a, a double espresso shot of understanding. It just gets you going. So consider that. June the 3rd, check it out on our website. Money fills your life with what? stuff. God fills your heart with satisfaction. All right, so seek wisdom. First, first piece of advice from Solomon. Second piece of advice from Solomon is pay now, enjoy later. Pay now, enjoy later. In the early 1960s, there was a Stanford University study known simply as the marshmallow test. Anybody familiar with this? It's actually a pretty famous study. Uh, researchers were, would give five-year-olds a marshmallow, and then they told them, I'm going to leave, but if you don't eat that marshmallow, I will give you two marshmallows when I come back. And then they watched the kids, how they reacted, and it's, it's just hilarious. I mean, they're talking to the marshmallow, talking to themselves, singing about the marshmallow. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty ridiculous, but the kids are doing everything they can, and many of them lost the battle. But what's fascinating, yeah, they devoured the marshmallow, right? But what's fascinating is that they followed these kids all the way through adulthood. It was a 40-year study, and they followed them all the way up to the age of 45. And they found some fascinating things about the kids who delayed the gratification with the marshmallow. They went on to have better, on average, SAT scores. They had less trouble with, less struggles with addiction, obesity, Um, They actually had better life skills, social skills. Now, how they measured that. But basically, 
they did better in life than their counterparts who were not, at five years of age, not good at delaying gratification. All this because they were able to say no to a marshmallow. Now, there was something they had learned along the way. They found also that those who ate the marshmallow were more likely to, to have struggles with addiction, keeping a job, and saving money. A follow-up study answered a question that some of you might be wondering about delayed gratification. The follow-up study was to answer the question, is this an innate behavior you're born with, and if you don't have it, you're out of luck? Well, they found that this was actually a learned behavior. You can actually learn delayed gratification. People can teach themselves how to do this. Your family may have been unstable when you were growing up. They're never keeping their promises. They're never following through. And you're always having to get what you could get when the getting was good. You know that kind of environment? They may not have taught you anything about delaying gratification. But you can teach yourself to do this. I'll give you a simple, simple exercise. You have an urge to buy something. It just hits you. Maybe it's tomorrow, maybe it's today, maybe it's a week from now. And what, you're, what you need to do is stop and don't buy it right away. You're going to try to invest in your self-learning delay gratification. Write it down, whatever it is, and why you think you need it. And then fold it up, put it in a desk drawer somewhere, and let it sit there for one week. Now, if you still remember a week from now that it's there, okay, some of you will totally forget about it. But if you, if you do, then go and pull that out and ask yourself the fundamental question, do I really need this? And if so, why? And if you're convinced that after a week of waiting that you still need it, then create a plan on how you're going to pay for it. That's learning delayed gratification. You delayed the gratification one week. For many of us, we never do that. You can learn how to pay now so that you can enjoy later rather than enjoy now and pay later. Listen, when you decide to pay now and enjoy later, what you enjoy is always greater because it's paid for. That's what Proverbs 21, 17 reminds us. Those who love pleasure become poor. Those who love wine and luxury will never be rich. And that's Solomon. And he was the richest guy that ever lived. I love what the message paraphrase says they says you're addicted to thrills <laughs> what an empty life the pursuit of pleasure is never satisfied in their book well-being the authors tom rath and jim harder made this observation after analyzing tons of research about human happiness and thriving this was kind of their summary statement they said this the single biggest threat to our own well-being tends to be ourselves Without even giving it much thought, we allow our short-term decisions to override what's best for our long-term well-being. What they're saying is our heart often works against our own best interests. Our appetites, they drive things. We choose to enjoy now and pay later. We spend money to get short-term relief rather than long-term enjoyment. But you can get that immediate gratification impulse to work on your behalf by going back to this guy, Mr. 100 Simoles, remember him? Start using the attraction of cash to your personal advantage. If you wanna get this psychology of, of delayed gratification to work on your behalf, instead of against you, start spending cash for most of your purchases because it's a lot harder to hand over this blue, beautiful, glorious $100 bill than it is to swipe a card, isn't it? Swiping a card's easy. In fact, the very vernacular, swipe a card, break a 20, break a 100. It's painful to even use the terminology. And if you don't spend it, here's the deal. If you, if you look at that 100 in your wallet and you go, ah, you know what, I'm not going to spend it. It feels good to keep it. Listen, if we have trouble with impulse purchases, if swiping the card is so easy for you and it's whittling away all your savings and all your well-being, try using cash just for a month. See what happens. Delay gratification to enjoy greater satisfaction. Now, here's what you're doing when you delay gratification. You are buying yourself long-term peace rather than short-term pleasure. 
It means that you're starting to get your spending under control. You're learning how to tell your heart to wait because your mind now is in control of the wallet. Our culture gets that all backwards, saying, hey, enjoy it today, pay for it tomorrow. Proverbs says that's not how you get rich. In fact, it's, it says that is how you will never become rich. Money fills your life with stuff. God fills our heart with satisfaction. So you want to make money fun again? Seek wisdom, pay now, enjoy later. And then the last one is this. Refresh yourself by refreshing others. Proverbs 11.25 says, The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. We want to prosper, I think, don't we? Personally, collectively. We want God to bless us, don't we? We'd like to be refreshed. The Bible says that there's a way that this can happen. If you want to prosper, then get good at unclenching your hands around your stuff and around your money and share it with others. This is not a pie-in-the-sky idea. This comes from the Bible. This comes from the Word of God. And here it is. If you are generous, not stingy, and you refresh others, then God himself will refresh you. God will bring the blessing back to you in his own way into your life. This isn't just promise. This isn't just a promise about money. It's a principle about life. Refreshing others leads to your own refreshment. And what we found is that, the, that most people who live this way, refreshing others, are some of the wealthiest people in our country. Rabbi Daniel Lappin wrote a best-selling book called Thou Shall Prosper. And in this uh, book, he explains some long-standing Jewish principles for gaining wealth and how to employ those in your, in your day-to-day life. And he points out that in every culture... Jewish people often rise to the top of the financial ladder because they practice these principles that are found in the book of Proverbs. The example he gives is that Jewish people account for only 2% of the population, but they make up 25% of the names on the Forbes 400 list of wealthiest people almost every year. now statistics tell us 2%, they, they, there should be about 8% people of Jewish descent on that list, but it's actually 60 to 100 every year. He says that it's no secret that their success to to how they get their success. He says they just live the culture of the Bible. This is a Jewish rabbi. Rabbi Lapin came up with this top 10 list of of, uh, living for a top 10 commandments for living a prosperous life. And number nine was this one. This I thought was really relevant to our study. Number nine commandment for living a prosperous life. Act rich. Give away 10% of your after-tax income. That's what rich people do, he says. The surprising thing about this book that Rabbi Lappin wrote, he's not writing to a religious audience. He was writing this book to a secular audience, a non-religious audience group of readers. And he said, you should give away 10% of your income, and here are the reasons why. And the main reason that he gives is the act of giving breaks money's hold on your heart. Think about that for a second. The act of giving breaks money's hold on your heart. Giving teaches you how to part with money rather than keep it safe. He writes this, The internal quality that allows you to take your money and place it at risk on the table of your own enterprise is exactly the same quality that allows you to take your money and give it away to others. In each case, you have to develop a willingness to remove your money from safekeeping and essentially bid it goodbye. He says generosity is the same thing as business investment. It's the same same thing. Not only does generosity, though, help others and give you an emotional boost, but it helps you become better with your money. It helps you you to see money as being fun again. Let me close with this. There was a guy by the name of Moses Montefiore, and he was actually named Moses, and it was was fitting because he was a modern-day Moses. 
He held high office in London, England, and was a close friend of the royal family. In fact, he was knighted by Queen Victoria in 1837. Later in his life, though, he wasn't known for his, his involvement in politics. He became famous for his philanthropy. And when he turned 100 years of age, on his 100th birthday, the Times of London devoted its editorial page to praising him. And one of the editorials, there was a, this notable exchange that they printed out, this dialogue that he had with a reporter. Someone asked Moses to reveal his net worth, how much you worth. This man who had ma amassed a fortune of wealth through business ventures and real estate acquisitions thought for a moment, and then he named a certain amount. Well, the questioner was surprised by the amount that he had mentioned and said, but surely the sum total of your wealth must be much more than that. With a smile, Moses Montefiore replied this. You didn't ask me how much I own. You asked me how much I'm worth. So I calculated how much I have given this year. We are worth only what we are willing to share with others. The title of this series is called Overflow. And it's the idea behind this entire series is that when Christ followers share their resources, when we overflow into the lives of others, those around us, and we do it for the purposes of good, to meet needs, to advance the kingdom of God, that process is a process that makes money fun again. See, you don't need to wait for something good to happen in the economy. You don't need to wait for things to turn around out there. You can make something happen in your own economy. All you need to do is seek wisdom, save now to enjoy later, and start refreshing yourself by refreshing others. Because the fact is, money fills your life with stuff. But God has the capacity to fill your heart with satisfaction. Which is more important to you? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the way that you have been impacting people's lives around here over the last several months. And uh, God, we just celebrate your work. We're grateful for it. God, I thank you for letting us be part of things that we'd never be able to do on our own. But together, we can impact so many people's lives. Lord, help us to be good managers of the resources that you've given to us. God, thank you for setting the example for what generosity looks like. We know Jesus going to the cross gave us his very own life as an investment in our future, our hope. And God, we thank you for that. Thank you for showing us what it looks like to overflow for the benefit of the lives of others. God, we praise you and we give you thanks for all that. Lord, will you turn us towards you when it comes to our resources, our stuff? Help us to hold things loosely. Help us to be able to take wisdom from those who know a lot more about this. Help us to pay now and enjoy later. And Lord, help us to refresh others and in the process experience the refreshment that comes from you. Lord, we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name.